Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. You who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, a few of you have been to a couple of other services. So you may have heard this story already. But uh, for those of you who have not gotten a chance to hear this story, uh, I want to share with you how I first came to be in ministry. Um, I became a youth minister in December of 1996. I had graduated from college, spent a year doing teaching, classic credentials for teaching, did a semester of student teaching, and here I was in December of 1996 uh, needing a job. And um, if you're in education, you know that coming in in the middle of the years can be very tough, um, depending on the situation, why the other teacher is gone now. Um, I really didn't want to do long-term substitute positions. That just didn't sound like something I would want to do. Um, so I was uh, maybe needing to find another job that could help support our income until the next fall when I could get a new teaching position. So about that same time, MacArthur Park Lutheran Church, just down the road on Nacogdoches, um, they had posted a position for a half-time youth director. So my dear friend and colleague, Shannon Elseth, now Bramer, from right here at Abiding Presence Lutheran Church, called me and she said, hey, they've got this opening at MacArthur Park, and we did youth ministry in college together. I think you'd be really good. You should apply. So I did, and I got the job. Little did I know that the students in this congregation had been through kind of a rough time. They had had a, the founding pastor of their congregation who'd been there over 30 years, had retired just a few years prior, so there was a lot of grief around that. And they had an interim pastor that um, had, there were some issues with him, and so it kind of divided the congregation, so there was struggle in the congregation. They had a youth minister that suddenly resigned his position and didn't give any explanation, and they were really struggling with that until they heard on the news after I was hired um, why he had resigned, which was because he had um, some inappropriate behaviors with folks. And, um, and then they had an interim youth minister or youth director that had been a member of the congregation that was volunteering, and she was beloved, but she ended up having to move away with her spouse to another city only seven months after she had been volunteering with them. So this is what I come into, um, and so that very first night that I met the church youth, um, they were a little bit disappointed, a little bit skeptical, a little bit cynical, a little bit tired, and so I'm introducing myself, and I'm looking at them with their scrutinizing stares, <laughs> and I finish my, hi, I'm Heather, I'm the youth youth director, and um, ask them if they had any questions they wanted to ask me, and it was very silent, and they all just stared. And then finally, one girl opens her mouth and says, very annoyed, so how long are you going to be here? And that was my call to ministry. <laughs> because I knew that this was a crossroads moment. I, I could tell them I don't know, which wouldn't exactly be a lie, but it was going to cause some tension or fear. I could tell them until next fall when I get a teaching job, and then they would never listen to me, and the next eight months would be completely wasted. Or I could decide in that moment to shift my future and embrace the authority that God was giving me to care for and teach this group of young people. So I did that. And then I went home and told my husband. <laughs> I made the decision to tell them as long as I need to be there. And so, of course, uh, at this time, they were a very lively and mischievous bunch. Um, they caused me to question my actual authority time and time again. In fact, so much that that summer, uh, before we went to the ELCA gathering in New Orleans, all of their parents gave me credit card numbers in case I needed to buy a plane ticket home. <laughs> that was before identity theft, just so you know. <laughs> um, they... The kids did know that I was responsible for them, however. I'd been put in charge of them. And so using the training that I had received, but mostly my love for young people, I was able to say no enough to things like, uh, can we throw water balloons from the rooftop at each other? Or can we go to a Marilyn Manson concert? Or can we visit Bourbon Street one night on the way back from the gathering dome? And I was like, mm, no, but we can go at 8.30 in the morning. And that kind of squashed that desire. 
But they finally realized and recognized after all of that that I was going to take care of them, that their safety, they were safe with me, that I was going to be responsible, that I loved them. And so they began to ask more questions that I could say yes to. More than the no, however, it was the relationships that I built, the love that we shared, the highs and the lows, the discussions that were hard, the grief that we worked through together in order to move forward, all of those things added to the authority that they gave me. So authority is a powerful word. And it's often a function, most of us probably have some authority over something in our lives, right? It's a function of our role, like parent or teacher or coach or CEO or police officer. Some of us have more authority than others. Um, in, in most of these instances, it's kind of just a, a function of that role, right? You, you don't get given the authority to be a parent. You are a, the authority as a parent. However, even though it might exist for us, the way people respond to it is important. And the way a person uses their authority determines the kind of impact that they're going to have on someone. So in today's gospel, we hear a story about Jesus going into the temple to teach uh, for the first time in Mark. So we've heard about his baptism. We've uh, read a very brief passage about him being tempted. He begins his ministry in Galilee. He's called his first disciples. And so people were being exposed to Jesus. He was starting to make a name for himself. He was getting talked about. And so as he was teaching that day at the synagogue, he had hardly established himself as someone to pay attention to. But then, as he's teaching that day, the people are amazed. And Mark tells us that he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. So he, they're already looking at him as one with more authority than the scribes. So why is that? Where did that come from? Um, my first guess is that just a few paragraphs above, when we hear about the baptism of Jesus, and there's this voice that comes open from heaven, the heavens are torn apart, and it says, this is my son, my beloved, whom I'm well pleased, and this dove comes down, and the Holy Spirit's entering Jesus, and like, if you weren't paying attention to that, I mean, you'd have to know somebody thinks something was different, right? But then we also can move into the Old Testament reading today. God proclaims to the people uh, in the wilderness and to Moses. They're in the wilderness. They're getting ready in Deuteronomy to enter the promised land. This is his final speech to them as they're going to go. Um, and he's telling them that there's always going to be one that God appoints to speak for God, just like him. But there's always going to be this, this voice to listen to. And God promises to send that prophet to guide them and speak as the authority for God. And so the people in the synagogue that Jesus is teaching in would know this, and they would be expecting that. And they could tell right away, because of the things that had already happened, because of the way that Jesus taught, that he had authority. And this was different, not just like the scribes and the Pharisees of that time, but there was something different about this Jesus that they needed to pay attention to. In fact, there was something so different about Jesus, even the unclean spirit recognized his power and authority and knew exactly who he was, and obeys his command. So as we look at how Jesus' authority is perceived in the gospel reading today, it's also important for us to see how people responded. The people in the synagogue responded by following, and listening, and learning in amazement, and telling other people his name spreads throughout the land and his fame grows because people are talking about him. And then even more so, as we go into Mark and the rest of the church here, we're going to hear the stories about people bringing others to Jesus. The unclean spirits obey Jesus. Those that aren't part of that following also bring people to Jesus. And sadly, on the flip side of this, as we enter into Lent and Holy Week, we're going to see that the scribes and Pharisees who thought they had that power and authority and who wanted that power and authority get freaked out by Jesus, and they begin to fear him, 
and fear the lack of their own authority, and so they make a move to plot and get rid of him. So as we recognize the authority of Christ as presented in this gospel today, it's time to ask the question, what do we do with that? What does that mean for us? Because the thing is, we are given authority by Christ as he ascends back to heaven. And in our baptism, we are called by the Holy Spirit to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of Christ through word and deed, to serve all people by the example of Jesus, and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. We don't need to wait for an invitation. We have already begin, been given the authority to do these things. And we're going to hear a lot more about this in the season of Lent, because each one of these uh, each one of these promises that we make um, or that we uh, are challenged to, to live out, these are what we're going to talk about on Wednesday nights during Lent. So I'm really excited to talk more deeply about our baptism and what God has called us or authorized us to do. But that's a lot of something to unpack today. So I want to give one nod, though, about what using our authority can look like that comes from our reading from 1 Corinthians today. Because following God's call to ministry, which all of us are called to ministry, not just me and Pastor Steve, but all of us, and not just here at church or with groups that we go out from church and do things together, everything you do in everyday life is your ministry. It's your call to serve God and serve others. And so following God's call to ministry can be kind of challenging or complicated, and it's hard to know what is our true authority in all of this, and what does it mean to live that out in our daily lives? So Paul in 1 Corinthians gives us a clue. Our call is about what is loving to our neighbor and what will be the most helpful to them. Do unto your neighbor as you would have done unto yourself. So if our behavior becomes a stumbling block to others in learning about their faith or practicing their faith, then we need to consider perhaps getting rid of that behavior. And this particular debate in Corinthians was about whether or not they could eat meat that was offered to idols. They, of course, knew that eating it or not eating it had nothing to do with their salvation because of what Christ has done for us. But others who were newer to the faith may not understand this one true God, and seeing other Christians also eating meat that may or may not have been sacrificed to idols, they might think, oh, that's okay, so I can believe in this one true God, and also eat this meat that's been sacrificed to idols because that's sort of what we do too. And so it was confusing for them. And so Paul says, the meat's not defiled. It doesn't matter whether you eat it or you don't. It doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. But if you are to eat this meat and cause your neighbor to fall, don't do it. Essentially, Paul writes that we should be careful with our authority and what message it sends. And to be mindful that we have influence over others. So we must think about the community as we, discern, as we discern what is also best for us. So coming back around to the good news of the gospel in Christ today. We remember that it is God in Christ Jesus who has the highest authority over all creation. But it's also important that we have been given authority by that same God just as the prophets of old, to proclaim love and the good news of God to all the world. And this is a precious task that we must perform with great care and consideration. But it's also a task that we must perform with authority and confidence, trusting that God's ultimate love and authority will transform those that we share it with.